All right, so taking a look at DMVPN from a very high level, we want to understand three separate components. Uh, the first is MGRE that we need to understand. The second is going to be next hop resolution protocol. And let's just go ahead and take NHRP for right now. When we look at next hop resolution protocol, the reason that we use this is that DMVPN is really based on three different sets of addresses. What I'm drawing here are three separate routers that are going to be located in three different geographic locations, all connected by the internet. Like any old router that you'd normally see, you're going to have a public interface and a private interface on each of these devices. And then, of course, we're going to need a, a tunnel interface as part of the program. One of the things that we talked about uh, with the MVPN is the fact that you have MGRE, right? So when we look at these different sites, let's go ahead and say this guy up top is headquarters. Therefore, he's going to be the hub. This is where we need to create that MGRE interface. And then if you want to leverage the capability of DMVPN to perform dynamic spoke to spoke tunnels, each of your spoke sites would need an MGRE interface. If you don't want spoke to spoke tunnels and you want everything to traverse through the hub, you could use a traditional GRE interface uh, on each of these devices. Remember the difference between with, with that GRE, um, MGRE versus uh, the, the, the multipoint GRE is GRE is traditionally going to be point to point. So you, you define this is where it's sourced from, this is where it's destined to, and things go through that tunnel. With MGRE, you can dynamically create lots of other tunnels as we're going to see going forwards. Now, in order to create those tunnels, a couple of different things are going to happen. You see, the, one of the advantages to DMVPN is the fact that we can build a full mesh topology. But traditionally, if we would try to do that with IPsec, that's going to result in uh, a crypto map statement with tons of different entries, lots of different crypto ACLs, uh, and we've got this requirement for static peer IP addressing, or you've got to use dynamic DNS. NHRP res, uh, removes that requirement because what's going to happen is each of these devices is going to have a tunnel interface, and we'll just call it tunnel zero. And this tunnel interface is going to have an IP address. So what happens is we basically have three sets of IP addresses now. One set is the inside. So let's say that our inside network is at 10110, 10120, 10130, 10140. And we'll just assume these are all slash 24s. And then we've got our public IP addresses. Um, my lucky IP address is 4.2.2.2. That's not mine. Don't use it in real life. But we'll say that this is 4.2.3.4. This could be 5.6.7.8. This could be 6.7.8.9. And then this could be 7.8.9.10. Just representing different public IPs. What Nexthop Resolution Protocol does, when each of these devices comes online, these spoke sites could have dynamic addresses on their physical interface. DHCP comes from the provider. When the site first comes online, the router boots up, the fact that we have this tunnel interface and the fact that we have it configured for next hop resolution protocol means that as soon as the router boots, he sees this interface, he initializes it with the configuration, he performs what's called an NHRP registration. He takes the tunnel IP address, and let's say that that's 172.16.1.2, and we could say that the hub has a tunnel interface of 172.16.1.1. This will be 172.16.1.3, and over here, 172.16.1.4. They're all in the same subnet. What's going to happen is you have a registration that occurs where we register our tunnel interface, 172.16.1.2, with the hub. And I say, hey, hub, I'm just here to register, and I want to let you know if you ever want to get to 172.16.1.2, please come to my public IP address of 5.6.7.8. The hub creates an NHRP registration table or binding table, which combines the public IP address to tunnel interfaces. Just like site A did this, site B and C are going to perform the same operation. When they boot, an NHRP registration occurs where they register their public IP 
to this tunnel interface. Again, public IP to the tunnel interface. All this goes into an NHRP binding table. Now, how would we actually use that? Well, one of the advantages that we talked about earlier in the class was that GRE gives IPsec the support, to, to the ability to support multicast, right? So we can run our routing protocols through GRE. Historically, whenever we built VPNs, what you had to do was construct what was to be encrypted. That goes in your crypto ACL. How to encrypt it. That goes in your transform set. Where to send the encrypted traffic. That goes into your peer statement. And you'd have to do that for every single neighbor. If your neighbor has public IP addresses which are moving around, you're in trouble because you'd have to reconfigure your router every time. Every time a new office comes online, let's say that we add site D, A, B, and C would traditionally have to be updated. Not with, an, uh, not with NHRP, MGRE, DMVPN, etc. What we're going to have here is the ability to run a routing protocol like OSPF or EIGRP across this tunnel. The really cool thing about that is when you, the routing protocol runs, what's happening is we're taking a statement like 10.1.2.0 and we're advertising that network statement through the tunnel interface. Well, when we send things through the tunnel interface, it's going to get an ESP header added, right? Because this is all about encrypting things across the internet. And then it goes into the central site. Just like we learned years and years ago in CCNA, when we're looking at WAN interfaces, we've got to think about rules like split horizon. We've got to think about the next top self that EIGRP does. Once we configure our hub site to manage the routing protocol appropriately, over here at site B and at site C, they've learned that the 10.1.2.0 slash 24 network exists, and they know that the next hop for this is 172. 16.1.2. If they ever wanted to communicate with that particular address, they could use NHRP to resolve it. So basically, let's say that B wanted to get there. Interesting packet comes in, maybe somebody on the 1013 subnet sends an ICMP ping to 10125. We look at our table, we see that in OSPF, we learn 10120s reachable at 172.16.1.2. So we perform an NHRP lookup to the hub. He leverages that NHRP binding table, and he sends a response back. And he gives it this mapping that we saw earlier, that 172.16.1.2 is reachable at 5.6.7.8. Does that make sense? What that's going to do is allow us to form a site-to-site -site connection. We can now send traffic to that host directly. Then let's say that it's an ICMP ACA request. It hits 10.1.2.5. He sends an ICMP ACA reply. The same thing occurs. The ACA reply comes into the router. The router goes, OK, cool. I know how to get to 10.1.3.0. It's reachable at 172.16.1.3. And he realizes with uh, that NHRP configuration that he needs to look up where does 172.16.1.3 live. So he performs that lookup via the NHRP server, again, our hub site. And he says 172.16.1.3 is reachable at 6.7.8.9. That's what was stored in this binding table. So we get that answer back, and then we can send the return traffic through the existing tunnel. One of the important things to understand is that once our tunnel is established, IPsec tunnels, remember your ISACAMP SA is bi-directional, your IPsec SAs are unidirectional, but you're still going to create both of them at once. The far site, in this case it's going to be site A on the left, when he performs the lookup and he knows who he needs to talk to, he'll just use the existing tunnel that's already been established. So that's basically a little messy, but that's basically the purpose of NHRP within DMVPN.